Now, if I can encourage everyone to turn their screens off again, we'll save all the bandwidth for uh, the reading, make sure it doesn't get garbled up and uh, make sure you're muted. I'll begin the second one here called He Said, Who Said, John Said by Don C. Martorelli. I would like to bring your attention to John chapter three, probably the favorite chapter of the Bible for most Christians. It contains John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell. It gives us the born again discussion by night between Jesus and Nicodemus. And we hear those noble words from John the Baptist, he must increase, but I must decrease. However, there is an enigma within John chapter three. We have a hard time telling who is talking. Who spoke the words of John 3.16, and who said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, John 3.13. Or who informed us that the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands, John 3.35. The background. As we read the Gospel of John, we see, we feel like we're there. We kind of get the feeling that whenever, whatever occurred one day was immediately written to paper the next. But we have to remember that this gospel was one of the last books um, written. Jack Hayford tells us that tradition tells us that the Apostle John moved to Ephesus before the Jewish revolt of 66 to 70. And he wrote the gospel in the last part of the first century. And Reverend Mike Dobbs, an apostolic pastor and evangelist, gives us more detail. He says the date of writing, the traditional view places it 80, 85 or later, after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. It's been 25 years since Paul's missionary journeys, 20 years since Paul and Peter's execution, and 56 years since the day of Pentecost. So probably close, close to 60 years after this John chapter 3 occurred, John's putting it to paper. Now this would make the Gospel of John the lightest written, and thus John would have had, he would have been more thorough. Many believe that Mark was written about AD, 6, AD 50, then Matthew was written about AD 55, probably improving Mark, and Luke was written about AD 60, improving Mark and Matthew and adding his information, and then John about AD 90. That 30 year gap, afterthought, contemplation, experience, and collaboration with many other first hand witnesses would have given John the most comprehensive, big picture perspective of the life of Jesus. And how might he express this? Let's take a look at the doubts of speakership. If one consults the typical red letter edition of the Bible, see Appendix 1, Jesus converses his conversation with Nicodemus. Shameless hmm? spring. Sorry? Shameless spring. Ah, thank you. Guys, you should raise your hand and let me know. <laughs> thank you. There we go. I'm going to share my screen. Didn't know I wasn't sharing it. Thanks for your patience there. Trusting me, every word I said was right. Okay, so we're on page 28. Thank you. So if one consults the typical red letter edition of the Bible, see appendix one, we're going to go there in a second. Jesus converts his conversation with Nicodemus, John 3, 1 to 12, into a monologue that is highly poetic and theological, John 13 to 21. Immediately afterwards, John the Baptist has a discussion with his disciples, John 3, 22 to 30, which he also converts into a lecture which is slightly poetic and theological, which is John 30, 31 to 36. So the question of this paper is who is really speaking and when? I'm going to take a quick look at it and show you what I mean. This is going to be in the center pages of the book if you get a hard copy, because I have color pages here. So here we have John chapter 1, red letter edition. I actually went to my daughter's bedroom and bought a Bible. It was red letter and they pretty much have Jesus saying all these things on left. He says, very, very, the man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He says, verse 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. Nicodemus says 9. Jesus says the rest up to verse 18, according to the red letter edition of the Bible. And then we have just those last few verses up here. Everything's in red. So they're saying this is what Jesus said. And then we have John the Baptist talking with his disciples. And then everything in blue here is John talking. And he talks and talks and talks. So the question is maybe, is there a place where maybe John the Baptist stops talking and Jesus and John the Apostle starts talking? Is it possible there's a part here where 
Jesus is talking and maybe John takes over the apostle and, and continues writing. Well, take a look. Here's what I am suspecting. What happens is here we have Jesus talking on the left column. If you look with me, we got the letters. And then I believe, starting in verse 13, that the apostle John adds his inspired color commentary. My font is looking pretty funny here. I don't know what happened to my font. And he says, you know, and so, so Jesus says this, and then John says this. This is my proposition. And he says it all the way down to verse 18 to 21. And then John's talking to his apostles in blue here. This would be my blue letter edition. And then I believe the apostle John takes over and actually says this. I believe this is actually the apostle giving his color commentary and adding to what John had spoken. So we're going to go and take a look at some evidences. I've scoured several books, apostolic and Baptist, and we'll take a look. Maybe one of my daughters can come downstairs and find out why the dog is barking and stick a sock in their mouth. Let's see, here we go. Okay. I'm gonna be there in a second here, there we go. So here we go, doubts of speakership. So the question of this paper is who was really speaking and when? Now Raymond in 2001 made an astonishing remark similar to my proposition. He says, I refer first to the two paragraphs in John 3, 16 to 21. Now I say 13 to 21. He says 16 to 21. And John 31 to 36. Their context may be continuing remarks by Jesus and by John the Baptist. Respectively, the NIV seemed to construe them as such by the use of question marks. These are just very long speeches but which may also in fact be reflections by John the evangelist himself on the themes touched upon by Jesus and the Baptist. If the latter case is correct, the correct reading of the matter we have in both instances, discourses by John upon the transcendent nature and origin of Jesus. An apostolic preacher and author, Fred Kinsey reports the same idea. He says, reflection, John 3, 31 to 36. It's not clear who was speaking in these verses of scripture. There seems to be no break between the Baptists speaking in 330 and these verses. Some of the statements do not seem to fit in the Baptist dialogue. Adam Clark assigned these verses to John the Baptist, while G. Campbell Morgan ascribed them to John the Apostle. It appears that these verses are a reflection of the Apostle John, so he agrees with me. I appreciate the recognition that there are thoughtful differences of opinion, even among the finest of scholars. Adam Clark and G. Campbell Morgan are very popular and solid scholars. Not to be outdone, we have the voice of Alfred Edersheim uh, to speak on the narration and notation skills of the apostle. He says, we can scarcely doubt that it was the narrator, John, who was the witness that took the notes. His own reflections upon it, or rather his afterlook upon it, in the light of later facts and under the teaching of the Holy Ghost, is described in the verses with which the writer follows his account of what had passed between Jesus and Nicodemus. In the same manner, he winds up with the similar reflections. The reported conversation between the Baptist and his disciples. In neither case are the verses to which we refer part of what either Jesus or John said at the time, but what in view of it, John says in the name of and to the church of the New Testament. So again, he's saying that John wrote chapter 3, 16 to 21. I insist it's 13 to 21. And he believes that John the Baptist did not speak verses 31 to 36 in agreement with myself. Alfred Edersheim didn't even doubt himself. He said, certainly. He's, he's a very confident scholar. He leaves no room to doubt his assessment of the situation. Typically, I have a lot of confidence in the work of Alfred Edersheim because I know that he has an extensive knowledge of the culture of the Bible that exceeds most, and it is that cultural barrier that presents the most problems to the modern interpreter. Now, Carson, Moo, and Morse they said twice in this chapter, the evangelist himself apparently offers his own extended comment. The first at this point, again, he starts with Alfred Edersheim at verse 16, 16 to 21. And the second, after his description of John the Baptist continuing witness concerning Jesus. From four quotes, we've received the opinions of seven witnesses. One consistency, which I have noticed among these quotes, spanning 120 years, is their identity of John 3, 16 to 21 as the words of Jesus, not John. Um, let's see, I think it's the other way around. Their identity 
of John 3, 16, 21 is the words of John, not Jesus. Um, now, I say that John 13 and 21 are the words of John, and they're saying that John 16 and 21 are the words of John. Who is right? Would it be audacious to correct 120 years of scholarly wisdom and consensus? Am I the only one who differs? Let's explore a little wider. We're going to go verse by verse. Verse 13, Jesus or the apostle. In this section, we'll look at each verse and hear the opinions as well as discuss any implications that might offer. Verse 13, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. Now, can we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus saying that the son of man is in heaven? No man ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Even a son of man which doesn't have. Now think about this. Hath ascended is in the past tense. In other words, he's saying that the ascension has already happened. And he's saying that now he's in heaven. So I'm thinking this has to be the apostle John talking. This verse received a boatload of support for being the words of Jesus from both oneness and Trinitarian perspectives. Here's a Trinitarian. He says, Jesus may imply a contrast with the Jewish tradition that Moses ascended not only Mount Sinai, but up into heaven to receive God's law. Now, wisdom word law has come, has come down from heaven in the flesh. Let's see, another Trinitarian, Jesus coming from heaven speaks with authority about this reality. God will give new and eternal life to everyone who believes in Jesus, his son. So again, I have in bold the name of the person who's speaking. So this person believes that it was Jesus speaking it. And the next one is... Um, I leave it to Hayford again. No, Raymond. Jesus, son of man's sayings include 313. Jesus affirms his messiahship and his pre-existence in 313. And here's a Pentecostal. A third reason why this incident is important is its statements of Christ's omnipresence. Jesus said that he possessed the unique ability of being in heaven and on earth at the same time. A distinctive quality of deity. John 3. 12 to 13, the visible man was on earth as the son, the invisible spirit was in both heaven and earth as father. But again, he's not talking about um, the father being in heaven or, you know, which is in heaven. He's talking about the son of man, which is in heaven. So I'm pretty sure it's still John talking, not Jesus. Although that's an interesting application from one is Pentecostal who thinks that Jesus said those words. A Trinitarian, he describes himself, Jesus, who had came down from heaven and asked his readers what they would think if they saw him ascend where he was before. And he also references John 6, 62. Now, John Chang, another Pentecostal oneness, in his book, One True God, gives the apostle John credit for 313, or he may simply mean that this verse was recorded in the Gospel of John, because so he mentions John, and he mentions 313, and it sounds like, was John saying this, or does the Gospel of John teach this? It's hard to say, so I couldn't really peg whether he was saying Jesus said it or John said it. Now, I do agree with the fact that Jesus pre-existed as God prior to his incarnation and that he ascended into heaven with his glorified body to serve as our mediator. But I do not believe Jesus spoke these words but the apostle John. I do not even believe, as Kinsey stated, that this was a declaration of the omnipresence of God because the words declare even the son of man, which is in heaven. I believe this was John speaking almost 60 years later. Will Houck, said the writer in verse 13 seemed to know that Jesus was ascended. Some scholars believe that the writer of this gospel or a later editor who knew about the ascension was looking back on Jesus's life and added this detail for emphasis. I can see John doing it, but I can't see editors. I, it, would, it would sort of violate my belief in the inspiration of scriptures. I believe God was in charge of this. Now think about this. It's a poetic tri-stitch. It has three lines, each ending with heaven and noting a situation never elsewhere declared by Jesus presently, but futuristically. He did say in John 6, 62, what and if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, which means he's not in heaven at the moment. He said this later. John was there when it happened, Acts 1, 9, and it was a post-ascension documented fact. John saw Jesus ascend, and he knew he had ascended. He was in heaven. So I believe John was the one who said, the Son of Man who is in heaven. This, I believe, is why we can be certain that John added 313 as commentary. Not as narrative. Jesus couldn't speak such a thought, but John could. Again, I just want to show you this verse again. See, look at the tri-stitch here. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, 
even the son of man, which is in heaven. So again, this is sort of poetic. I don't think that Jesus would wax poetic and especially talking about something that hasn't happened yet. In chapter six, he's going to talk about it. You know, it's going to happen. And so if it hasn't happened by chapter six yet, I'm pretty sure it hasn't happened by chapter three. I'm pretty sure that's John talking. Going down to our next verse, verse 14 and 15, they go together. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So is this Jesus talking or John? Ask yourself this before we dive into it. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So again, now we're looking toward the future, aren't we? As Moses lifted up, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. These verses can be treated together because they complete one thought. This use of the brazen serpent as a metaphor for crucifixion certainly originates from the mouth of Jesus, for we hear him in the Gospel of John preaching. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted this up the Son of Man, and you shall know that I am he, that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and I... If I be lifted up from earth, will draw all men unto me. So again, these lifted up verses might more be talking about crucifixion, but they might also possibly be making a half, you know, a sort of a, a nuance about mentioning the serpent in the wilderness. It could be a reference to the serpent in the wilderness, but I think it might be more leaning towards talking about uh, lifted up and crucifixion. What are the testimonies of this passage coming from the mouth of Jesus? Who believed this? Well, Alfred Edersham believed that Jesus had taught in the temple as well as to Nicodemus. It was in this same double reference that Jesus could speak of being lifted up. That's uh, David Norris. Jesus rebuked Nicodemus for not understanding spiritual things and explains that Jesus, the son of man, must be lifted up in the same way that Moses lifted up the bronze snake in the wilderness. So again, he's giving Jesus credit for saying these words. Kinsey, a one as Pentecostal, said Jesus used the Old Testament account of the brazen serpent as an il illuminating illustration to Nicodemus of the requirement of obedient faith in order to be saved or to be born again. Another one says the new birth discourse of Jesus, possibly the verse 21, Raymond, Jesus' own comments in Jesus' early Judean ministry where he refers to his being lifted up as a serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. So again, these are several references to people thinking that Jesus said this. And in one true God, one is Pentecostal, Chang said that Jesus is credited with speaking verses three, four, chapter three, verses 14 to 15. So again, several times he gives Jesus credit for saying those words. Now, in spite of so great a cloud of witnesses, I still have my doubts. True, Jesus himself may have invoked the brazen serpent allegory by using the phrase lifted up. But that is no indication that John may have quoted it here to bring clarity to the conversation. Who else agrees with me on this? Um, what they need, is, I, Julia Scott agrees with me. He says, what they need is eternal life. Now, eternal life being a phrase that in John largely replaces the kingdom of God. So again, he's saying that John, since he uses the kingdom of God, uses eternal life in place of where they would normally say kingdom of God. I think he's saying that this is something that John would have said. Julia Scott could infer by reason of selection of synonymous phrases that the author believed John 3, 3, and 5 to be spoken by Jesus, and John 3, 14 to 16 being the words of the Apostle John in agreement with my proposition. It is amusing because this commentary on the Bible featured the NIV translation, which attributes those words strictly to Jesus. Craig Keener credits John with verses 14 to 21 by pointing out the Greek tenses that John selected for those verses. Now, narrators do not, or at least should not, take liberties with synonyms or tenses when quoting people. So again, if Craig Keener credits John for choosing particular verses and, and tenses, and it sounds like he's saying this is the work of John. And I hope that he's saying that. In this passage, now if this passage had appeared before verse 13, I might have been tempted to believe it was Jesus speaking, because only Jesus refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. I find, and I double-checked it, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John simply refer to Jesus as Jesus when they're narrating, except in John 3, 13, and 14. So again, this is probably the only passage where I think one of the evangelists was writing and actually called Jesus the Son of Man. 
In 3, 16 to 18, Jesus, John calls Jesus the son of God and son, the words also rarely used by Jesus concerning himself, which is why I believe 3, 16 and 17 and 18 are the words of John. Now, this passage points to the future, but it's intercepted by verse 13, pointing to the past. Now, this is an exception I'm willing to stand on. It must be John. Is it possible that he could be quoting Jesus from some other time and inserting it here in his commentary? Like he heard Jesus say at some time in his life, these verses from 14 and 15, and he decided to insert it in his commentary portion. Because it sounds like it would, because if Jesus calls himself son of man, and if John's calling him the son of man, surely John is quoting Jesus, but not at this discussion. It might have been another day in another place where Jesus had mentioned that. And he decided to insert it here because it just fit perfect. He says, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna weave in my theology, my understanding of theology, and I'm gonna weave in other quotes from Jesus. So maybe I would even turn those into red letters because it's him quoting Jesus, but maybe from another period of time, not from this particular discussion with Nicodemus. And we continue with the, the glorious climax of the whole chapter in 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, these verses addressed together were launched from verse 15. This could either be the line of demarcation where many see John take over and drop the greatest truth bomb or a crescendo of truth that naturally flowed from Jesus after being strategically positioned in verses 14 and 15. Now, I tend to hear the use of the past tense in John 3, 16 to 7, indicating it was John. But it's equally possible that the past tense only relates to the sending portion of the passage. For God so loved the world, past tense, that he gave his only begotten son, past tense, that whosoever believeth in him future should not perish, but have everlasting life. The gospel of salvation is available from this point forward. It still looks a bit like John. We'll listen to the witnesses. <clears throat> now for the witnesses, let's hear from more who believe these were the words of Jesus, and that Nicodemus was the first person to hear John 3.16. Thus, when John 3.16 records Jesus saying, and this is Brother David Norris thinking this is still the words of Jesus. At that point, Jesus spoke words that expressed the core of God's saving grace. That's Kinsey, a one that's Pentecostal as well. Erickson says that where cites Jesus' statements about having come to do the Father's will, John 6.38, and the Father having sent his son, John 3.16, as evidence of the eternal authority submission structure. Erickson doesn't say what he believes, but he says what Ware believes. Now, Jesus explains to Nicodemus the way of salvation and the reason he came to the world. Okay, that was, I forgot to put the person's name in there. That was Will Hawk again, and uh, thinking it was Jesus. Now, everyone here seems to be trusting the Red Letter Bibles. When they make these claims of Jesus quoting 3, 16 to 17, they feel no need to provide evidence, the same as those who feel these words were crafted by John. They just say, this is what Jesus said, or they say, this is what John said. When John declared, that God so loved, 316, quite literally he intended by the word world what he intended by it in 1 John 2.15. Now, John did write 1 John 2.15. So he wrote both. According to John, and he quotes chapter 316. Accordingly, does these words of the apostle John, John 3.16. And Edersham, the guy who uh, was one of our most incredible scholars of the 1800s, he says, what follows, John 3, 16 to 21, are not the words of Christ, but of St. John. He believes this is where it stops. This is where Jesus, his discussions ends, and this is where John takes over with his color commentary. In them, looking back many years afterwards in the light of completed events, the apostle takes a stand as becomes the circumstances where Jesus had ended his teaching of Nicodemus under the cross. Now, I still believe that verse 13 needs to be where John began depositing his poetic and deeply theological spirit-inspired ruminations, crowning in the gospel in a nutshell. It's not impossible that Jesus said this, but I doubt that he said this at this time. This whole passage, 3, 16 to 17, sounds too polished, too past tense, and too detailed to be something Jesus would say to Nicodemus at this early stage of his ministry. In this next chapter, Jesus tells a Samaritan woman, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So can you see the future tense there? 
It's just not here. Amen. And here we're seeing past tense. And Jesus, when he's talking, he's talking about the future. Verse, page 34, our last portion of this reading of Jesus, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. And so the red letter edition stops here. And I stopped a long time ago, but many of us believe this is now uh, John talking. Now, I love this text. Every phrase is golden, but the questions remain, who though? Do we think wrote it? And why do we think so? 3.19, this is uh, Raymond speaking. Light has come into the world. He says in, in a par par parenthesis here, is John speaking here? John uses the noun judge. John, he teaches that Jesus will judge the world someday in 3.19. So even though he's asking, is John speaking here? He pretty much gives John the credit for all these verses. In the discourse of John 3.11 to 21, Nicodemus faded into the background and Jesus began his soliloquy another literary device of John. Although the speaker was Jesus, it is apparent that the writer, Apostle John, intended to speak to his readers through Jesus. Okay, so this person is saying that from verse 11 all the way to 21, it was the Apostle John crafting a speech using the theology and snippets of Jesus's um, lectures in it. Now, Wilhock seems to assume that the Apostle John would use narration to make Jesus a puppet to speak his own condensed messages. And it seems either naive or disingenuous to suggest such a method. But I'm certain it is based upon a conviction that this is the message of Jesus, not the narration of Jesus. Again, we all believe that this is the message of Jesus that John wrote it, but not the narration of Jesus, because we don't believe this is what he actually said to Nicodemus on that particular night. I feel that this entire packet of data following Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus is too condensed, too distilled, too professionally packaged to be just one chat session. This reads more like the first epistle of John, which, by the way, was also written by John. So I believe that from verses 13 down to 18, I believe that was John, because it sounds like what John would write in his own epistles. Now we go to our next section. Verses 31 to 36. Now, I'm going to begin with verse 30, where John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And then we go to where I believe the cutting off point is. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Now, again, look at this poetic stuff. Um, we have two, we have four stitches here. The first and last end with all, and the second and third end with earth. So again, I'm seeing I'm seeing too much poetry here. Uh, it looks too polished. Now, getting back to my text, it says, I wanted to begin with verse 30 so we could see the conclusionary statement, which as a mic drop seems to end John's brief monologue. The very next verse feels like we're reading 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The first man is of the earth earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven, which was written 40 years before by that highly educated Paul of Tarsus, the apostle of Jesus Christ. That's right, this is the middle of the book. Okay, so there are fewer controversies and fewer witnesses who testify to whether it was the Baptist or the evangelist who penned the words from verses 31 to 36, and I have some surprises for you. Kinsey continues to credit the apostle John with verses 31 and 36, as they collude with John 14, 6 to 7, in letting us know that, what the, that the Son reveals the Father. He says the Father is always on location in the Son. And he says this, saying that the Apostle John had written verses 31 to 36. Edersham says, and St. John, looking back upon the relation between the Baptist and Jesus, on the reception of the testimony of the former and the unique position of the bridegroom, points out the lessons of the answer of the Baptist to his disciples, John 3, 31 to 36, as formerly those of the conversation with Nicodemus, John 3, 16 to 21. To the contrary, we have the apostolic author, Eric Chang, who claimed that these were the words 
of the Baptist. John 3.31, these are not Jesus's words. They are likely to be those of John the Baptist, who is certainly speaking in the previous verse. So here's one guy who claims this is probably John the Baptist still talking. I will side with Edersham and Raymond simply because of the poetic nature and well thought out theology that I doubt John the Baptist would have known. Now, John knew a lot more than we should ever figure out. How did he know this stuff? But I don't think he would have known this deeply, the doctrine of the Son of God. Verses 32 to 34. And this is John speaking. Is it John the Baptist or John the Apostle? And what he had seen and heard that he testifies, talking about John the Baptist. He's talking about himself possibly in the third person. And no man receives his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. Now these verses contain teaching about Jesus in the third person, Jesus and John the Baptist, both in the third person, much like we see in John 3, 13 to 21, which many credit, credit to Jesus. Is it no wonder that some people might read these passages and possibly in the haste of a very large research project like a book assume that this is also Jesus talking about himself in the third person? David Norris says, it is for this reason that Jesus could speak of having the spirit without measure. See John 3.34. And Chang, the one is Pentecostal, says, to put the matter into its proper context, we must take into account the many verses where Jesus as son expresses his total dependence upon and total submission to the Father. John 3.35. Now again, these verses are either John the Baptist or the Apostle John. And yet both of these brothers say that it was Jesus talking. This might be a beneficial. Many could, maybe this could serve us notice. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in the first person. From verses 3, 1 to 12, he says, I, six times. And if we have two witnesses speaking from the gut that they feel like John 3, 34 and 35 look like the words of Jesus spoken in John 3, 13 to 15. Because 3, 3 to 15, Chang says those are the words of Jesus. And 3, 13 to 17, Brother Norris says those are the words of Jesus. And these words, spoken by John the Baptist or John the Apostle, looks like what Jesus spoke in those earlier passages. Perhaps they're confusing John's Jesus lecture with John's Baptist lecture. They look the same. And looking at the later verses without the context, it would be easy to mistake that this was Jesus' style. So again, because they think it looks like Jesus, it's because they're thinking that John's previous color commentary looked like Jesus. But I think there's some benefit to be had from there. It's easy to make that mistake. These guys wrote very huge books. They both had about 400 pages each. I can imagine they just made that from the gut assumption it was Jesus, where it may have been John using the same style he had used about 20 verses earlier, where they thought that was Jesus too. 35 and 36, the father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, most of our authors have given blanket testimony to this whole section being the handiwork of the evangelist, Kinsey, Clark, Peterson, Carson, Moo, and Morris. He's all said that this was the work of the Apostle John. Two have credited to the Baptist, G. Kimmel Morgan and the NIV. Wrapping it up, we only have two distinct references to these vinyl verses of John, which we haven't discussed yet. And Raymond says, according to John 3.36, John, he can speak of eternal life as a blessing in the eschatological future. And so here, these, this last guy with his last two quotes, he also gives credit to the Apostle John. The evangelist has it. There is practically no contention that the Apostle John wrote the awesome summary following John the Baptist's testimony from verses 27 to 30. Now, based upon the similarities between 3, 13 to 21 and 3, 31 to 36, pointed out by those who thought verses 34 and 35 were Jesus speaking, I feel it's safe to say that the Apostle John was the author of both of those secondary portions. Of particular note is the transition of first person from John chapter 3, 7 to 12, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and in the third person talking about Jesus in, this, in verses 13 to 21, and also 31 to 36. So here's a little table I put together. Um, on the left-hand table, we're looking at the verses 13 to 21 and asking ourselves, who said these verses? 
We've got 12 people saying that verse 13 was spoken by Jesus. Two over here saying it was John, me, and Will Hawk. Then nine people say Jesus spoke verses 14 and 15. And eight people said Jesus spoke verses 16. And then it drops down to four people thinking he said Jesus quoted 14, 17. And then two people from that point forward believe Jesus spoke the whole thing. One of them being the NIV red letter, red, written on NIV Bible and the Red Letter Bible. Otherwise, no one else believes this whole passage was spoken by Jesus. However, saying that John spoke these verses from 13 to 21, starting off with me and Will Hawk at 13, and then as you further you go down, the more people we have bearing testimony that these are the words of the Apostle John. Over here on the Gospel of John, the second portion, uh, we see that not many people believe. There's one guy, Chang, who thought uh, verse 31 was written by John the Baptist. And again, the NIV Bible and the G. Campbell Morgan believe this was all the speech of John the Baptist, waxing very poetic. And then over here, six of us believe that it was all the work of the Apostle John. And there's two quotes of Jesus by Chang and Norris. A little embarrassing there, but again, they wrote very big books and they were probably just speaking from the gut. And so I believe that bears testimony that if these verses look like Jesus, it's probably because they're thinking that these verses look like Jesus. And these verses weren't Jesus, they were John speaking. So these verses were probably John speaking as well. So now that is the conclusion of the paper. We can take our videos off of mute and you can raise your hand or take your um, microphone off and I'll know that means you wanna talk, amen. Um, does anyone have any gut reaction to this? Anyone have any questions? I have, or some, I have something. Yes, uh, uh, Don, in a, a verse, I, I'm just interested, you probably know, in verse 15, 3, 15, uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Of course, it's in red, uh, like Jesus speaking. But I'm interested, uh, this here, uh, on original uh, Greek, uh, him, in him. Shouldn't, if it's Jesus, say uh, it will be that whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have eternal life. But uh, it's talking like in third person, it says him. What is it on original in a Greek that word him? Is this a translation? Uh, question here, issue, or what, what do you think about that? You know, uh, do you know from where I'm coming? I do, uh, yeah. Because yeah, there yeah. have been many times I've seen, actually not many, but a few very key times where sometimes it, it might have been in a plural and they mm -hmm. translated it singular, or it was in a singular and they translated it plural because they were Trinitarian. They, they, they made transitions. I'm pretty sure this is a faithful translation. And I believe that, you know, Jesus did talk about himself in the third person. He would often say the son of man came out to do this. And he would, he would talk about himself in the third person. And this is talking about Jesus in the first person. But I still believe it. He doesn't call himself the son too often or the son of God. He calls himself usually the son of man. You know, but here we see, I believe it's John talking in, and talking in the past tense. He's talking 60 years later, saying whosoever believed in him should not perish. And, and so that is a faithful one. You know, maybe he would say me. You know, he that believeth in me, as he does talk about, he does talk that way many times too. So again, you're right. I don't think, I think you're saying this is not the words of Jesus because he would have said me, you know. And I don't believe it's a matter of the word me is in there and they translated it him. I'm, I'm sure this is a, a fair translation. There's nothing um, scandalous in this translation. I don't know what is it on original, you know, that word him. I have a, I'll look it after. But okay, I, I'm probably, interested. interested. It's probably Altos, which means him. I'm pretty sure it probably is. I wish I could look it up real quickly, but I know I'll slow my computer down. Well, correct. Is it? Yes. Okay, thank you. That confirmation, appreciate that. I don't know how. How do you know it's Altos? Can, can you read Greek? I just read the the, the concordance. Okay. <laughs> concordance. That's great, because sometimes you might see the letters in English, and, and sometimes the word's legible, and sometimes it just has characters that people don't recognize. Good question. Anyone else have a question or a comment? Even if you disagree with me, I'm loving it. I, I love, you know, to hear the, uh, we, we can, 
There's no, there's not one narrative here and everyone else is going to be silenced. <laughs> You've destroyed my childlike faith in the, in the red letter edition. <laughs> hey, it gives you a challenge. Now you can go ahead and make, you know, a more precise red letter edition. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Don. But you know, no one, almost no one says that these verses are not Jesus. There's only one other person in myself who say these words are the words of, of John. You know, and all, a lot of scholars say, starting from verse 16 down to 21, this is John talking, but almost no one of the really good scholars say that these verses appear. So I'm, I'm stepping out. You know, it, does, anyone, does anyone see room for error there? Or, or you, are, do you think I'm pretty solid with my conclusion? We will come back to you, but I believe uh, Brother Sabin made the same comment a number of years ago at a minister's conference, minister's retreat. Yeah, about verse 13, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a retrospective. By John. This is what woke me up. This is what brought my attention to the whole topic that needed to be done. I said, That can't be Jesus talking because he's not in heaven when he's, when he's talking there, you know. But John, 60 years later, yeah, Jesus is in heaven. No man ascended to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You just don't like mental gymnastics, brother Don. <laughs> now, I say something. Yes, Jenny. Uh, I was listening. It was very interesting. But uh, as long as I know that these words in here, whether who, one, two, or three said it, this is the living word of God. This, these words are living, active, and alive. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not going to take that from you. Amen. Because you're right. And it's, it's very interesting. I was, I, was, I was, When I get my paper book, I'll be understand more what this because people you've got to have a an opinion where who who is it is it the is it jesus is it, is it john or is it the other john so i'll learn it when i get my paper book yeah on occasion the bible does say things it doesn't teach for example there is one time where the bible says that god heareth not sinners but that was a pharisee talking so you know god even though god quoted the prim word perfect doesn't mean he was right. So we have to, uh, sometimes you have to watch out. Even though the Bible says something, the Bible 12 times says there is no God. And yet here we are believing in God. Yeah. Yeah. It says, the fool, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, and someone uh, else says, there is no God like you. But if you just kind of chop off some words, you can get there is no God. And you can teach it if you want to, because it's in the Bible 12 times, word perfect, there is no God. But again, context. Mm -hmm. If you get the context, you can sometimes come across some very clear words that don't teach what the Bible teaches. This is uh, mm. that's why you're having this thing. <laughs> that's why we're having the symposium. Symposium. Yeah, exactly. A symposium. 